I do want to give you some pointers on forecasting uh, before uh, I have you start making decisions for round three. Uh, but in general, when I'm talking about sales forecasting with students, I always tell them to keep it simple in round one, right? In round one, everybody started off identical. Um, we can try, you know, to, to do a deeper dive into the reports, but ultimately what we're going to find is that we calculate the average, right? So round one, I always tell them to keep it simple. Take your market demand, divide it by the number of companies. You just figured out the average unit sold. Since everybody's the same, the average should be pretty close to what happens. Now, that's not to say they should just totally ignore any changes they made. Uh, if they're making extreme changes to things like price, obviously it's going to impact what they sell. Uh, but if they don't do anything extreme, the average is a good assumption in terms of what's going to happen. As soon as we get to rounds two through eight, better data equals better forecasting. And I'm going to walk you through two different ways you can get a forecast uh, using the market share method and the survey score method. Uh, honestly, I think the survey score method is by far the best, so we're going to talk about that more, but I do want you to be aware of this market share method because uh, it might be intuitive uh, to a lot of students, or it might seem like an easy way to do a forecast. It's not a terrible way to get a forecast, just to be clear. Um, I would just consider it more of like the B method of forecasting and not the, the A plus method, right? So round one, we'd take our total industry unit demand. Uh, we would factor in the growth in Capstone 2.0. You can see this 8,067. You don't have to calculate it yourself if you just look at the marketing page and you look at the demand this year. Uh, but if students are in the reports, you got to remember we're looking at last year. We need to, we're, we're forecasting for this year. So step one is calculate the demand for this round. Uh, in this example, it'd be 8,067. Uh, we have six teams. I would just divide that by six and we get, you know, 1345 for our forecast. In round two and beyond, uh, you know, we've been talking about stockouts in the last two debriefs and actual and potential market share. In this example, you know, there were two companies that benefited from stockouts on uh, the other companies. The two beneficiaries would have been Erie and Andrews. Everybody else stocked out, missed out on potential sales. Now, what you'll see happen sometimes is uh, teams will go off of what they sold and factor in the growth rate. And, you know, if there were stockouts last round, what we sold last year might have been more or less than what we really expected. I know as we were going through round two, Baldwin was probably thinking, oh, I wish we built more in a couple of cases uh, because we saw that, you know, that they did a great job of generating demand for their products, uh, but they fell short of supply and their demand in a couple of those markets. When that happens, uh, you could look at the potential uh, market share and use that to estimate what you're going to sell this year. Same concept, market demand times our expected market share gives us our forecast, right? This is good, not great. The problem is that, you know, your market share last year might not reflect where your product is now, where it is today. Um, what if you updated your product on like December 28th, uh, three days before the year ended? Well, last year we might have been selling a product that's totally different uh, from the product we are now selling this year in year three. Now, your best indication for what customers think of your products now are these customer survey scores. So the calculation to estimate your market share is just to take your score and divide it by the sum of all the scores in the segment. So, you know, we're going to do an example here uh, where we're going to look at product aft, that's 32 for our score, and we're going to divide it by the sum of all the products in the segment. So if we did that, uh, aft had a 32, if we added them all up, all the products equal 127. I would take my score divided by the total, and that's my expected market share for this year. Uh, I'm going to use this percentage uh, to get my sales forecast. So I would take this year's demand times my expected market share. And, you know, what I really expect to sell uh, in this example would be 692. Looking at 
uh, that prior method, you know, had I assumed it was the potential market share, well, it only would have been 497 units, and we probably would have stocked out. Uh, that's because aft just so happens to have ended that round quite a bit better uh, than where it started. You could stop there. Right? You could call this your forecast, 692 units, and be done with it. Um, I think you know, it's a decent way to forecast, right? It's not perfect because I want you to remember that when we use our, our customer satisfaction scores, we're looking at a frozen moment in time, right? We're looking at, this is what our product was graded on December 31st of last year. So it's like our customers filled out a survey yesterday and told us, here's what we think of you and everybody you're competing with. Uh, that's extremely valuable information, but what it ignores are any of the changes that you made for the current round. So you need to think about, you know, what did we do to our product in R&D? Uh, how's that going to impact the age of the product? What about the positioning? Uh, when is that revision date going to happen? You know, it's entirely possible that we make a really strong update to our product, but it doesn't finish until the end of the year. Well, if it finishes in December, I would say that revision is going to benefit you more in the following round, more so than it's going to benefit you this year, right? This year, you're selling your product from how it started the year, from those specs, at that reliability, at that, you know, positioning, and maybe by the end of the round, you made it better. But again, if it happens very late in the year, it's really going to benefit you in the following round. So, Long way of saying, think about the changes you made. Did I change the price, right? Well, if I did, did I make it more expensive or less expensive? If I made it more expensive, I'm probably gonna sell a little bit less. Um, how much less? Well, it varies by segment. It depends how much we changed it, right? If I'm changing price in the low end market, I'm expecting it to have a lot more of an impact than if we're adjusting the price of our high end product, right? In low end, it's the most important criteria, price. Uh, in high end, it's the least important. So, you know, we need to think about how much did we change something? How important is it to customers? And at the end of the day, we're going to just adjust our forecast accordingly. It's not an exact science, right? I don't know if I lower my price by a dollar. Well, is that going to give me 40 more sales? Is it going to give me 60 more sales? I know I'll sell more right? Because I know customers will like that lower price, uh, but how much more also depends on what our competition did, right? If everybody lowered their price by a dollar, it sort of cancels out the fact that we lowered our price by a dollar. So you do need to remember we have competitors, they are making decisions, they're trying to beat us, you know, what are they going to do with their products or what do we think they're going to do and just forecast as best we can right? And we don't have perfect information. Uh, let's do the best with what we've got. The best approach to avoiding emergency loans is to be a little conservative with your forecast and marketing. If you want to be optimistic, the place to do it is in your production department. So in marketing, think conservatively. Think of this like the guarantee. I guarantee I'm going to sell at least this many units. In production, it's okay to build a little extra. The assumption is anything you build above your forecast will end the year's inventory. Now, I'll give you a quick example of what I would do when I'm forecasting. I would do that calculation where we take our score over the sum to come up with my forecast. Let's pretend that that came out to about 1,200 when it was all said and done. 1,200 is a really easy number to work with because it's 100 units per month. So if I think I'm going to sell 1,200, what I do is I'll actually forecast 1,100 or 11 months, and I'll produce 1,300 or 13 months. Uh, now, it's worth noting, if I had inventory, I'm building 1,300 minus whatever inventory I had on hand. Uh, but we want to have 1,300 units total in production and we're gonna forecast 1100 in marketing. When we advance the round, the only way we're gonna end up with an emergency loan is if we sell less than our forecast, which shouldn't happen because we're being conservative. Could we sell less than 1100? Sure, uh, but the likelihood of it happening is a lot lower uh, than if I put in 1200. 
right? What I really think I'm going to sell. You might get students that ask you, well, why am I building more than we think we're going to sell? Why don't I just build 1,200? Uh, the short answer is, well, you might do better than you're expecting, uh, or your competitor might stock out. If either of those things happen, I think it's worth the risk to uh, risk carrying one month worth of inventory that would cost you 12% if you had to warehouse it, or uh, you sell it and you end up making 30 to 36% for your margin. So if you sell it, the benefit is roughly three times as good as if you're stuck with one month of inventory. Inventory only really becomes problematic once we start stockpiling it, right? If we have uh, more than three months worth of inventory, that's typically where it starts to chip away at our margin. At this point, I'm going to send you to your breakouts. Uh, you'll have an hour to make decisions.